This is WCN, the Whole Care Network. You talk, we listen. Content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the Whole Care Network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice, and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Even in the best cases, this is an incredibly difficult job. And so we want to be especially mindful of how much harder it is on people who don't have any resources. Caring for aging parents or other loved ones while working, raising children, and trying to live your own life? Wondering how to find the time for your personal health and happiness? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Happy Healthy Caregiver Podcast, the show where real family caregivers share how to be happy and healthy while caring for others. Now, here's your host, family caregiver and certified caregiving consultant, Elizabeth Miller. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast on the Whole Care Network. If this is your first time listening, welcome. This is a podcast produced bi-weekly to help family caregivers integrate self-care and caregiving into their lives. Each episode has an accompanying show notes page. So if you would like more details about the topics, products, and resources we speak about, you'll find the show notes by going on to happyhealthycaregiver.com And underneath the podcast menu, click the image for today's show. I am grateful for my listeners. Your ratings and reviews have helped expand the show's reach and impact more caregivers' lives. If you haven't left a rating or review for the podcast yet, please, please, please consider doing so by visiting bit.ly forward slash HHC pod review in all caps. Before we get into today's caregiving spotlight episode, I want to first shine the light on our episode sponsor. Researchers recognize that the true disease experts are those living with a condition and their family caregivers. Researchers like to include the voices of these experts in their studies. Rare Patient Voice, or RPV, helps connect researchers with patients and family caregivers for over 700 diseases and conditions. For patients and caregivers, RPV provides the opportunity to voice their opinions to improve medical products and services while earning cash rewards. Rare Patient Voice, helping patients and caregivers share their voices. If you're interested in participating in research, please consider joining the RPV panel at rarepatientvoice.com forward slash happy healthy caregiver. In today's show, meet former family caregiver Debbie Howard. Debbie lived and worked in Japan for 30 plus years. She's also a former family caregiver on a mission to change the way the world looks at caregiving, so the impacts are not so devastating. Her work focuses on providing companies with support programs for employee caregivers to mitigate the related risks of absenteeism, employee turnover, and extra health care costs. We dive into this topic and we also chat about how caregiving was a transformational experience for Debbie how she shared the care with her sisters while keeping her own business running, the concept of joy journaling, and how simple steps can have a ripple effect on lasting change. Hey, Debbie, welcome to the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast. Hi, Elizabeth. It's great to be here. Nice to see you too. It's been a long time. I know we met so many years ago, it feels like, and I think it was 2016, the first caregiving national caregiving conference that we i went to in chicago and you were there it Um, was yeah so so many people i find it interesting that there's still so many tight relationships from those conferences so that and and this is just one example yes yes those were those were wonderful conferences and uh, really a great hotbed of of collaboration and meeting each other. And you're right. I have lasting friendships from those early days. I know. Thank you. I, yeah, perfect. Well, we, we kick off um, the shows with a little bit of inspiration, words of wisdom from Happy Healthy Caregiver Jar. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on today's message. It says, 
So many, so many <laughs> of them are like, idea. so many are like, pick me, pick me. They're flying out of the jar. It says, um, to get through the hardest journey, we need take only one step at a time, but we must keep on stepping. And that's actually a Chinese proverb. Um, to get through the hardest journey, we need take only one step at a time, but we must keep on stepping. Mm -hmm. What is that? Does that remind you about anything with caregiving? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, I think that's a fabulous saying. And it also applies to what I'm doing this week, which is launching my second book. <laughs> but um, it, it's it's with caregiving, I think it's so difficult to keep our focus on what we're doing and why we're doing it. And also to see some perspective of the end, the light at the end of the tunnel, because no one wants to look at the light at the end of the tunnel because it's not a light, it's mm -hmm. the end. And so I think just, uh, you know, taking that step at a, at one at a time is, is always something good to remember. And we can also apply this, I think, uh, to self-care. I know you talk a lot about self-care. Um, you know, it's, it's very overwhelming to uh, think you have to do everything that we know is involved in self-care. Like it's, I can't even do it and I'm not even actively caregiving right now. It's it's very, very challenging. So when you're caregiving, uh, just getting a little movement in your day, uh, making sure you're not eating junk food to take a shortcut, um, uh, getting a little time for yourself, even if it's only five or 10 minutes, um, all of those things are so important. Sleep, getting getting enough sleep. And let's say you don't get enough sleep one night, you get four hours. Well, why don't you take one step and make sure you get six hours the next night? Mm -hmm. You know, they say you cannot catch up on sleep, but I've been testing that all my life. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, and, and your proverb that you pulled, the proverb you pulled uh, brings to mind another one, another Asian one about um, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. So yeah. it's the same idea, right? It feels really big, but uh, if you can just take that one step, you you open up your world to a, another another spectrum yes. of choices. Just start. I mean, that's basically like just start. That gets out of your own head. And what about Bob? That movie where he just like you know one thing at a time because you do you think about the big picture and it's it's overwhelming and it's just the one day at a time. There's there's a lot of um, gifts in that. And then I think sometimes too like the about the steps. What made me probably you know capture these? Sometimes I'm like, what made me capture this quote and put it in my jar is. You know, I think too, we, we try to wait till we have all the answers on everything. And sometimes we got to make a decision with the best information we have at the time. And we put a stake in it and we move forward. And then there's no looking back and regretting it because we did. We made those decisions with the best info we had. And that's such a good point, Elizabeth, that we can't always know exactly everything we need to know. So getting started is a way to start knowing as well, mm -hmm. I believe. So you can, because you do, you, you, you make a decision and then you correct, you course correct. Yeah. yeah every day, every day. <laughs> yeah. um, tell us a little bit, Debbie, about your caregiving story. Oh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, you know, my caregiving story is like so many others, um, you know, hard to tell. Um, and also, uh, but I, I also get great comfort out of telling it um, because it honors my mom. And, um, you know, my, my mother was 75 years old when she was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and she was completely healthy up to that point. No, no, just wow. vitamins, just vitamins. Yeah. Wow. Indeed. And so, and in our family um, of, of super strong women, right. We, 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 we're pretty much guaranteed 85 to 90, you know, and, and a lot of, a lot of us make it past 90. So wow. 76 was just what, too early. And, and um, early, so early and such a shock for her. Um, I was working, uh, I've, I have a long-term career in Japan, working as a market researcher. And uh, so I was running my business in Tokyo. And when my mom was diagnosed, I became a caregiver from afar. So for the first year, I was 
immediately, of course, escalated my trips home. And those are international, you know, 20 hour door to door trips. Um, and yes, that's a whole, that's a leveled up long distance caregiver. That needs its own name, international exactly. distance caregiver. <laughs> Supercharged from afar. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but it, it, it's no, even if you're three hours away, or you're an eight hour drive away, it's, it's, it's the same set of problems, right? You're not there. Uh, I was very fortunate. My sister lived about an hour from my mom in the same town. So where we all grew up in Greenville, South Carolina. So um, we, we were able to get through the first year fairly well. Um, and my sister who lived nearby uh, is, was also a respiratory therapist professionally. So imagine the fortune. Yes of having a respiratory therapist in your family on your care team for a lung cancer patient. So, you know, that was a really amazingly fortunate thing. And um, my other sister lived uh, here in Texas where I live now. So she was three states away and both of them had full-time jobs. And, and, and of course I was, and you running did my, too. Yeah, yeah, we were all run and I was running my business in Japan and, um, we didn't have time for such a thing. And none of us, no caregivers <laughs> have time for this. We've got our own lives. You know, we got, uh, you, you have children. I don't have children, but I owned my own business. That was my child. And, and I was working flat out and, um, we somehow made it through the first year, Elizabeth, we, we spotted each other, you know, uh, my middle sister took care of the daily needs, uh, because she was close by. And then my other sister and I would fly in and give that third sister a break. And, um, and we spotted each other literally after one year of that, this is, this is the, the, for me, this is the most hardest hitting fact from my experience that really drove home to me why I need to be working in this space. Three strapping 50 something year old daughters. Okay. All in perfectly good health were completely spent after one year of what I would call pretty light caregiving. Mm. Okay, now you can, uh, we can all argue about whether chemotherapy is light caregiving or not. It's not fun, but it's a lot easier than what happened in the last six months. Let me just put it that way. Right, right. Where you're lifting and you're care the physical, there's an emotional strain and then there's the physical demands. And then when you layer that together, it's a, an overwhelming sandwich for sure. Exactly. And after one year, the other thing that's really important is that again, spotting each other, uh, all of those my two sisters, FMLA, Family Medical Leave Act, was expired after mm. one year. And one worked for the government and one worked for a hospital system. So they had good programs. But imagine that, right? And, and of course, I owned my own business. So I was up front and center to give up my, my situation because I was the only one who actually could manage to go home and help my mom. And fortunately, I had a fabulous young team in Tokyo and, and this was in 2007 and eight. So we did have, of course, the internet and all kinds of things. And I already had a, a pretty uh, fully leveraged laptop laptop lifestyle <laughs> flying around all over the place and doing my work. Uh, so I, I moved back to Greenville, South Carolina, and I ran my Tokyo business off my mom's dining room table and, um, you know, maxing out time zones and office depot and whatever else, I, whatever service I could get, you know, to do that. And um, it was pretty hairy, uh, but my mom and I had a deal. Uh, my mom was a business person, by the way, like a Fortune 500 purchasing agent. So she had no trouble saying what she wanted and, you know, when. So um, we had a deal. She said, you can, you, you, I, I really do, would love it. I said, I want to come home and help you because you need help and you, it's not safe for you to be alone. And she goes, I can't have you doing that, right? I can't have you giving up your life. And I said, look, I'm bringing everything with me. <laughs> I'm going to set it up on your dining room table. And she goes, okay, then um, the four hours that we have the helper 
every weekday morning, those are your hours. You, you know, I, I'm not going to interrupt you. Those are your work hours. Well, you know what really happens, Elizabeth, right? Then I'm going to the grocery store. I'm, I'm doing things that you got to do as a caregiver. Mm-hmm. Um, I Running actually, a household and everything. Yeah. 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 So I, I actually uh, did most of my work late at night after my mom went to sleep and that was okay. It worked out. Okay. We, we had a good deal. Um, she was very true to her part of the deal. And, and we did have, we did have a four hour a day helper five days a week. Now that's another amazing thing that I want to point out. So I have a fam. I, first of all, I have two sisters we can share and we got a sister power shout out to sister power. And we got along, we, we, lots of families just implode. And mm-hmm. so my sisters and I are, have always been a team. We were able to work together. Uh, one of them was a respiratory therapist, a medical professional. Um, I had my own room at my mom's house. We had um, four hours a day, five days a week helper. That was amazing. I, I, Many, many people do not have even those three things. And so I like to say, Elizabeth, that my situation was pretty much as good as it gets. Right. And yet still not great. Like you're not, you're not getting enough sleep. You're not, you know, you you need to clone yourself to get to be the person to pay the bills and go to the grocery store. But to your point, you, I know why you're sharing that. You're sharing that because you want to make the point that like, you had these opportunities and you made it work, but we are the exception. I would say I'm the exception too. You know, we have a little nest egg. My family did get along. Um, You know, my work was very understanding of me taking my break. I didn't have to take FMLA. I could have had I needed to, but it was just like they said, you do what you need to do, um, which was a nice gift. I still worked, but not everybody has that. And we have to kind of set up our world, um, not for the best case scenario, but kind of for the worst case scenario in some ways, or even the middle of the road case scenario would be a, a big, a big step in the right direction. I agree, Elizabeth. And, and, and I guess the point it's, it's all of those points. We, we definitely need to be thinking about the worst case scenario. And also, even though mine, in my opinion, and, and yours maybe too, were sort of best case scenarios, it almost killed us all. I mean, we, we were, uh, it's been 11 years this fall. I, I, I'll probably never be the same anyway, but no, uh, but, and, and that's and I okay. Still I, cry I, sometimes. I still cry. Sometimes I still cry. I still leak. I still have my own trauma from it. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. And, and so even in the best cases, this is an incredibly difficult job. And so we want to be especially mindful of how much harder it is on people who don't have any resources and and so um you know it's good for you to have the compassion of that like i think that is a gift debbie to have the compassion to see that not everyone's situation is the same as as mine and yours like i had someone comment you know i had a a nice news story lately that went out um a segment and it was kind of like wait, what's the big deal? Like someone kind of commented and it was kind of like, what's the big deal? You know, don't we just take care of our older parents? They took care of us. Like I saw this- that comment. Yes. And I was like, I don't know if you saw my response to it, but I was like, how do I respond to this? It's like assuming that everybody's situation is yours. And that is not the case. Like, and just because, you know, they, they survived it or we survived it doesn't mean that it can't be way better for other people. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Like it's, I, I believe it can be better. I think we all have the power at any time in our lives, in any situation, it could be your career. It could be anything, self-care, anything, even unrelated to caregiving. We all have the power to choose how our situation and our experience is going to be. And we can't always control all the pieces and parts within it. And it's not always going to be easy, but we can make a choice every day to be happy and joyful. For example, we can make a choice to have our caregiving experience be something that uh, gives us something in our lives rather than take something away. And, and I, I 
I advocate making your caregiving experience a transformative one. So you, you, you know, for me, I, I'm looking retrospectively. I didn't have this perspective when I went into it, but what, what I saw was that I had to dig so deep emotionally and I did not have the tools that I needed in many cases. And so what I advocate is to be proactive as a caregiver about getting the tools you need. And I know this sounds easy. It's like saying, please take care of yourself. And you're, you you just want to strangle the person, right? Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> that statement alone makes you want to strangle, but if you share the how and you, and, and you can share the how, cause that's why yeah. I have family caregivers on this show. It's like, we are the experts. We, we walk this talk. We talked and walk this talk and, and, so you 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 get to say it. You get to say it because you share the tips. So yes. how would you, you know, how would you how would you live that out? And for and we call you a godspeed caregiver, right? Like after you've trans, gone through your transformative experience and you do have that gift of hindsight. So oh, I what, didn't know that. That's good. I have a okay, I got a I got a new a new term I can write down. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, well, through the through the stages of caregiving that um Denise Brown teaches, the last one is the godspeed, you know, after caregiving ends. So what would, you know, not like shooting on yourself because I definitely don't want to do that because grace you get all the grace uh, but just reflecting on it like as a caregiver advocate you know would you have done something differently yes there's a couple of things there are, are a they? couple of things well um one one of them is that even though we had a really good plan and I'm a big big planning advocate but and my family that was another advantage we had a good plan we even though we had a really good plan and we had the wills and the power of attorney and the do not resuscitate and all of those things done. And uh, I, I knew where everything was. And we, we had a lot of those pieces in place. The one thing we had not talked about was what were we going to do at the end when my mom needed more help than the three of us could offer. And that was, um, we, we, we couldn't know how bad it was going to be, right? You, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And you think it's going to be fine. And my mother said, oh, you girls can help me, right? It's fine. But actually, Elizabeth, it was really, really hard. And near the end, about three weeks before my mom died, um, it was just getting so intense that um, it, it, it was becoming untenable. And my mother had long-term health care insurance. This is another great thing that was, see, you had it too. So that these are, these are amazing things. 13% of the population over 65. Has, we didn't have it, but my parents were financially okay. So it did matter. It didn't matter. So that's excellent, right? That, that is such a relief. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we, you know, we had not, my, we had that part-time helper four hours a morning, right? And I, I and said- And that got paid for through the long-term care? Yes. Okay, yes. good. And, and that was fantastic. It was such a relief to have her. And she, but we, I said to my mother, we need more, mom. I need another, I need another four-hour shift person, right? And uh, because I'm not getting my work done and it's just getting super intense. And, you know, I joked with my mom, I said, you need a body slave, right? You need, you need, you need somebody just sitting there waiting for whatever it is you need. On demand and, care, like an infant. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And, and so my mother, of course, near the end, no one wants new people in the house, right? Mm -hmm. Dying is a very private thing. And we know my mom's going, she knows she's going. We all know the facts. We're trying to make the best of it. Um, you don't want a stranger in the house. It's, it's a very weird energy, you know, to have somebody you don't know yeah. in the house when you're trying to do something so personal. And so, but I, I begged my mom, I said, look, we have more money. Uh, we have more insurance left. And I even used the argument with her, like, we're going to lose money. You're leaving money on the table, man. You know, like, that's what I said to her. <laughs> well, because you knew her business brain would get it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, use whatever you can. Use yeah. the manipulation you can. Yeah. So she said, well, okay, let's talk about it. And so I vetted, uh, I vetted, you know, you go through interviewing all these people and vetting them. And a, one of them got through me. I got 
her to my mom. My mom accepted her. We signed a contract. I had to force my mom to sign the contract with Kelly Temporary Services, which isn't around anymore. And this woman was going to come uh, on Monday. And I was leaving on Friday on an international trip. And that was one of the other reasons why I wanted an extra helper in the house, because I knew my one sister would have her hands full. Yeah. And and uh, so I found out while I was on my international trip um, that my mom fired the helper after a day and a half. It was like she she and the the helper was fine. It wasn't the helper. It was just sure. The situation. Yeah, the situation. And I really respect uh, everyone's right to end their lives the way they would like to and 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 to make it as pleasant as possible if you can. Um, And I tried to be an agent to help my mom do what she wanted to do. Uh, I told my sisters after my mom fired this woman, I said, look, you it's up to you because the two of them were in charge while I was gone. I said, it's up to you. Um, if you, if you want to do it and you don't want to override mom's decision, but you have the ability to override her decision because she signed the paperwork, you just get another worker in there that you like, um, and just override her decision. But, um, my younger sisters are not as mean as I am. (laughs) Yeah. You're the tell it. Oh, you, you and I have a lot in common there, Debbie. You're the tell it like it is uh, daughter, tough love. I call it. Tough love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my, my, my younger sisters couldn't do it. They couldn't override my mom's wishes. And I'm, you know, I'm smiling Elizabeth because, you know, it is a, it's a bittersweet story to tell, you know, Uh, we didn't get any extra help at the end. And my sisters were overwhelmed. I'm flying around to Tokyo and Australia doing my business thing, making speeches and stuff. Um, and which you have to do to pay your bills. Like you did, that's okay. You know, it, you guys had a, a, a tag team there, but it, it was overwhelming. I know, I know your, um, your book, which I meant to have it here for the video, but, um, I wrote about it in the, in the last book haul that I did, um, the caregiving journey. And so people can really get a sense for some of your lessons you learned, the end of life. Like, yes, there it is. Thank you, Debbie. Um, and I'll link to the to the blog post too, but there's a lot uh, in there. And, you know, you do a lot of speaking and things for um, businesses because you've been such a, you were a working caregiver that like, you know, and, and you have the tattered cape to prove it. You know, you're, um, but tell us a little bit about what you do with Aging Matters International. Okay. So with Aging Matters International, I have two big projects. One is the first book that helps individuals. And the second is the second book that's coming out. There next it week. is. I'm nice. sorry. These are my stick. I'm still. <laughs> yeah. It's a process. The caregiving crisis it calls what it costs your business and how you can fix it. That's right. And this one's for companies. So what we realized uh, pretty quickly, and I think all of us in this space realize that we can help individuals and there's lots of things we can do. But if we cannot get it distributed, get the help distributed, it's really um, falling on deaf ears. So one of the distribution points for caregivers is companies. And that's because companies uh, employ people. And 30% of every worker in America is a caregiver. So that that means that I'm surprised it's not higher, actually. Well, that's the that's as high as we can get it by the documented statistics. But you're right, Elizabeth, it's probably, of course, if it's probably closer to 40. But then if we include, um, and that would include, let's say, sandwich caregivers, if we go to 40, 30, 40. um, If we include uh, rank and file parent caregivers, if I may, just not disabled children, just regular kids, then of course we're getting up to 60, 70%. But just when we talk about older adults and disabled children and uh, under 18 and over 18. Mm -hmm. Neurodiversity, um, all of that, military caregivers that are working. Oh yeah. Yeah. We're we're at 30 to 40% of of the workforce. And Mm -hmm. so we... I believe that the companies are a fabulous point 
through which to uh, distribute education and training about caregiving. And I say that because we help people in companies with everything else, right? We help them with parenting. We help them with, we help working moms with flex time. We help uh, people with alcoholism problems and drug abuse. We, we help employees. Why can't we help the employees with their specific caregiver needs? That's, yeah. that's a, it's a, it's a known contributor to psychological, uh, to emotional, physical and financial stress. So it's an easy thing to work on when we think about um, being proactive. Yes. And providing uh, training and education that helps people to be better prepared and then to deal with it when they're in it. I know for me, when I, you know, I resigned from my corporate job last May, it'll be almost a year, but so I could congratulate. Thank you. Big, big deal. Gave myself a big pay cut to to have a healthy caregiver full time, but I'm doing life's work and I'm doing my passion. So, um, but at the working in that company, you know, I was, a I was involved in the employee resource group for women. We didn't have one specifically for caregivers, but a lot of women of course, um, are the caregivers and, you know, I remember having conversations to try to change the dialogue where I worked. And it was a bit of a, you know, a male network up top. Um, It wasn't a bit, it was, it was a male network at the top. And so really just educating them about the woes of caregiving and even some of those executives who became caregivers, like I was their person they would come in and talk to and, you know, just offering speaking services with them in my role that I was in. But I remember too the challenges of like going to my boss and saying, you know, I'm taking time, my personal time to take my mom to the doctor. And he was kind of puzzled. Or no, it wasn't even that. I was going to do what you did, Debbie, of relieving my sister in Michigan. Right. Every every three months we kind of had this deal where I would go and I would relieve my my sister with my mom. And so I would take that and I said, This is not vacation time. And he was like looking at me and I was like, This is caregiving. Like I'm going to care to be there with my mom. And this is personal time off, you know, however you want to count it. But this is um, so it just even the challenges there with it. It's like, I think that you, sh- you know, and then I would have to show him I'm like, actually, you can take PTO for any member of your direct family. And but it's just like educating. And it just, I just was thinking to myself, it shouldn't be this hard to, you know, explain um, the time there. And like I said, I had a company and, a, and I'd build trust with my company to to but not everybody has that um, capability. And I know they were changing the, I mean, they were late to the game even with maternity leave. So they were way behind the eight ball and they were changing the leave um, so that it could be more general for a caregiving leave or a parental leave um, was in the works. But are you, is it getting better? I think is my question. Like, are you, are you're in, you're in these conversations, like I'm going to employers and I'm speaking on caregiving and self-care and I'm excited to see, like, I know one example was I inspired them to start their own caregiving caregiver affinity group. And I love that. Um, but are you seeing it get better and what can employers do to make it better? So I'm thinking, um, that it is getting better, Elizabeth. It's, 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 you know, I estimate that at about a third of all companies have, have the, the basic, uh, well, let's, let's put it this way, a little more than the mandatory. Okay. okay. And then, you know, let's say another, uh, the, the other two thirds have the mandatory, but that varies from state to state. And it also varies with the size of the company. So a company with 50 or less, 50 employees or less, I don't think they have to do certain things. They they don't they don't have to follow FMLA. That's right. a, that's a federally mandated thing. So uh, smaller when you get into smaller companies, you you get into a whole other situation. It's kind of variable based on the state and the owner, if you will. Uh, so so that's a, a definite um, concern for you and I to look at when we think of caregivers. You know, and we could talk about care, helping caregivers in the workplace, but actually that's only addressing about half of the workforce because mm-hmm. the rest of them are contract workers or working in smaller companies that don't have to do certain things. Mm-hmm. So uh, my feeling is, Elizabeth, that the and I, I, I know we all, you know, everybody who talks about everything, you know, it's kind of like looking for the silver liner, lining in COVID. But 
honest to God, the prolonged pandemic has helped highlight this problem. And I am so thankful for that. Um, we, we were screaming into a dark hole before. Mm-hmm. I, I'm sure you've sensed this, right? Oh, I, and- I think the same thing. I mean, you, I mean, my heart was breaking for the caregivers who were at home trying to, the sandwich ones in particular, who were managing the virtual school and working their job and caregiving. And then, oh my gosh, there's the pets around all the time. And these people got to eat more meals at home. And uh, I, I, you know, I'm an empty nester now. I, I didn't have those. Um, my kids are in college with, when all of that, but it's, Yes, I do think it has gotten their attention. And I think that is why people are reaching out to folks like you and I to come in and 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 offer resources and speaking because I think they're they're also seeing the great resignation, right? Where people are seeking sanity for their mental health. Um, and just like life's too short. I'm gonna, you know, and I guess I'm kind of included in that number, frankly, but uh it it behooves them to also invest in their caregivers because we need these people in our workforce. We do. We do. And what we know is that companies are losing money little by little because of caregiver related cost. Things like absenteeism and productivity, uh, things like turnover. Like when, when a caregiver has to leave the workforce, and that often happens in about a third of the cases, um, the company loses the institutional knowledge and they also have to rehire and retrain. So uh, there are real costs to the tune of $68 billion a year for American businesses um, related to this bleed. And yet, uh, as we know from the Harvard Business Review report called The Caring Company, um, companies are not tracking caregiver related costs. So my new book shows companies how to and what KPIs they can look at. What, how can you repurpose existing KPIs and add a few key performance indicators to help you understand and get your head around what this is costing your company? And so I help you do that, make a rough calculation. Uh, my book helps you look at your programs that you offer to all employees and look for good candidates for repurposing for caregivers' needs. And that's very easy to do. So you look at, uh, let's say every company, most company, many companies have uh, like stress and burnout prevention type course. Mm. So you take that course and you add two or three hours of training to it for caregivers. That's an easy slam dunk. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can do the same thing with financial and retirement planning, making sure that people have actually thought about and, uh, and considered the idea of how they're going to pay or help their parents pay for long-term health care. Um, you can do the same thing with health and wellness yeah. and self-care. So you can look at every things that you basically already got and you got work and mom programs, just plug caregiver in there and, yes. and, and roll them out. There's so, so many things I know that like, I didn't know I even had at my company until way after I needed them, like the employee assistance program. Like what if there was, if there was a caregiver affinity group or ERG, or there was some thing that was doing that to highlight that, but that's a perfect example, Debbie, of like, this existed. I could have gotten therapy for myself. I could have gotten therapy for other people in my household or my mom, a, potentially a grief counselor or something. I could have had them investigate all of, we were doing it on our own, like finding the, um, the, the assisted living communities that were going to be a fit for my mom. Like they have those people that do those data searches yeah. for you. Yes. Yeah. Some companies provide care coordination services and they, they, they're sometimes they're voluntary or, you know, sometimes they're yes. already rolled in or sometimes you can just get it for an extra cost, which is fine. Right. Yes. It's just that you don't have to go look for it. Telehealth was another one. Telehealth. Yeah. And then the company would have vetted them. So you wouldn't have to, as a caregiver, go through that agony of vetting. So it, it, it's a really, um, I, I think a lot more companies are, are getting into this game with looking at their overall workplace experience and the different kinds of employees. What my I see my job it, as, Elizabeth, is to make sure Adult uh, caregivers of older adults are in the line for benefits and help 
because now, you know, you get, we're in the back of the line right now. Okay. There's DEI, there's cybersecurity, there's all the, get, get, let's get people back to work, you know, remote work. There's all kinds of things diverting attention from caregivers of older adults. And, and this problem has existed for 30 years or more. So it's not a new problem, but the pandemic has shown us how bad it is. And also the aging of America and the rest of the world has highlighted for many people the, 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 huge, the hugeness of this problem. Mm -hmm. And it's not going away. It is not going away. It's only going to get worse. And my my po my position is that if companies don't proactively address this, it's just going to become a bigger and bigger problem. Oh, I didn't mention what future healthcare costs, because let's say you're a caregiver and we know that you're going to suffer emotionally and physically, at least maybe financially as well. The stress that you undergo often has implications later in your life, in your health. So it's more, it's more expensive for companies. And my job productivity and my absenteeism and all of that, like everything. So mm -hmm. take care if you pro, I mean, it's like anything else in life, Elizabeth, right? If you're proactive and you take one step at a time, going back to the first point of the show, um, you can actually improve the situation. And I'm asking companies to take one step, take yes. the first step, take a look at what you're offering. And then once you take a look, you'll see where the gaps are. I help you take a look at it, <laughs> identify the gaps, and then start filling them little by little over the next three years. And pretty soon you're going to be looking much, much better to your employees and to the communities that you serve. Yes. I'm I'm right there behind you, Debbie, push, pushing for it. And I know, I know you are. I see everything that you're doing on your I can't read to read your book. First of all, you got to share it, share it with me for the future book haul that will be coming on Happy Healthy Caregiver. I will. Um, so again, the caregiving crisis, what it costs your business and how to fix it. I love that because it's not like, hey, here are all the problems. It's like, no, these are the problems, just FYI. And then here's the nitty gritty on how you do this step by step. And and I'm here to help you or Debbie's here to help you. Um, yeah. What? It's not. Can I say one more yes. thing? It's not even that hard. It's not even that hard. It's like common sense. Yeah. It's common sense. Look at your programs. Find the gaps supercharge a few of them, right? With some modules for caregivers, add a few services that as you can, as a company, if you can afford concierge services for care coordination, et cetera, those are available. Those are absolutely available in, in the marketplace right would now. You call, would you call Torchlight one of those? Yeah, yeah. I think Torchlight, okay. Wealthy, those, those are great services that a company can pay for and provide for its employees. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can, you can, companies could also uh, broker long-term healthcare insurance to offer, you know, for special deals for their employees. Mm -hmm. uh, they could also um, offer uh, coaching and counseling services. There, there's legal uh, services, financial, all of that. Yes. It's really, really limited by imaginations because caregivers need so much help, but it's not that hard and it's not that expensive even. Yes. Um, but, but it, 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 it's, um, it's one of those things that gets swept under the carpet a lot and I'm tired of that. So that's why I'm dedicating the rest of my life to it. Yes. Yeah. You're That's it's yeah, I hear you. What? Um, and you're on Clubhouse too, talking about it. I know there's you and um, some of your fellow advocates have uh, gotten me to, to check out Clubhouse and, and be a part of that. But that's maybe just share a little bit of like, what is Clubhouse? Why would somebody maybe want to tune in to what y'all are doing there? Okay, thank you. Uh, Clubhouse is an audio only format um, that kind of grew and became successful during the pandemic. Um, it is a very interesting place where you can find 
thousands of different topics. If you look at, if you just go to Clubhouse and start looking at what's there, you you might turn it off because you'll you'll just be like, <laughs> if you're like me, yeah, yeah. you're overwhelmed. But um, in my case, I was really fortunate that one of my old friends from Tokyo, uh, Linda Sherman, ha- was uh, leading a room called the Alliance for Age Friendly Products. Let me say that again: Alliance for Age Friendly Products. Okay. And that is co-sponsored by AARP hmm. and AARP Innovation Labs and also the Consumer Electronics Association. So we it's got really good sponsorship. And we also gather uh, people from many different disciplines. So we've got some caregiver experts. We've got product development experts. Um, we've got inclusion in design experts because we need to make sure when we're researching, you know, we don't want hot shot 20 year olds developing apps that no 65 year old has ever tried. Right. What is that? Right. That that's <laughs> yeah. ridiculous. So we, and, and, and if you're, it, it sounds silly, but you would be amazed at how many things get get through the the gauntlet without actually having been properly tested with, with users, real users. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we talk about that. We talk about marketing and messaging today in clubhouse. We have it every Thursday, that room today, we talked about the importance of nutrition and we heard from some new alternatives that are coming into the retail store alternatives to ensure and boost. And Oh yeah. uh, like like proper recipes with supercharged nutrients that are more than just empty calories. Yes. And and we talked about it from the assisted living viewpoint. One of the chefs from one of the uh, a really progressive assisted living community talked about how they use uh, color, shape and molding to make uh, pureed foods look and taste palatable. Mm. And that was fascinating, right? Like yeah. it's the difference of taking a green bean and a, a, a mass of green beans that's pureed that looks all of green and making it a little greener and maybe making the form look a little more attractive. Yeah. And, and then you see residents start actually picking up their fork and going for it instead of being more passive. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're encouraging independence. I mean, food is so important to uh, our lives and, and hydration as well. So I was going to say, if, did you talk about hydration? My husband works for BioLite. I should have had him come on. Well, why don't you send me his information yeah. and we will have him on the next one because I know most of the yes. topics we end up doing a second one later in the year, Elizabeth, because what happens is we learn so much in one hour that by yes, having it overflows. You know, yeah, six different people talk about it from six different angles. It's actually very interesting. And um, mm, I'll definitely like, connect you. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, we heard about hydro gummies today. And we also heard about uh, Zinnia TV, which is designed for dementia and cognitively challenged folks. And they have programming on their in their uh, lineup that encourages the care receiver to drink and shows people drink babies drinking people drinking it shows people drinking and so it it it, it encourages uh, a cognitively challenged person to drink more mm. and then also it will show somebody doing the hand over hand tipa snow method helping and so they things are not things are more normalized and yeah. drinking becomes a little easier um and the, these are really important things so i'm sorry i go off on club no but, but i mean that's good i think that it, you're making a case for why people would want to tune in so yeah thursdays on clubhouse and we'll link to it it's the alliance for um, age friendly age products. friendly products is the room yep. um which, which you need so yep. yeah no i think that that's yep. amazing um and, i do oh, there's go ahead one, one more thing one more room i know we're we're running out of time but one more room on mondays the first mondays of every month christina keys of caregiving.com and i do a room on shifting the culture of caregiving Ah. So we, we, we talk with podcasters. This is the one you yes. uh, joined us for. Thank you so much. Uh, we talk with podcasters, book authors, everybody participating in this space, trying to raise the level of the discussion and, and move towards good solutions. Um, you know, I it's think all it's about, great. Yeah. The, raising the, awareness. 
They're not, they don't live on forever, right? Like, can you go in and find old ones? Actually, now, um, if you, this is a, a clubhouse has added replays. Okay. And, and that's very important because I don't think any of us would be doing this very much if we didn't, if we didn't have replays. <laughs> yes. I want my, I want my words lasting for a while, at least. Yeah. I know um, the one we talked on was on support. So I'll look for the replay link yeah. on caregiving support. If you go to my Debbie, the carer at Debbie, the carer on clubhouse, and you just scroll down through my bio, you will see all the rooms I've been a speaker in right there. Ah, perfect. Yeah. That's a good trick on clubhouse to know it's it. And you can just click on the room and hear the replay. I think you can download it. Let me just see. Uh, you can even download the audio. And then yeah. you can take it on a walk, which leads us into self-care. So I definitely wanted to get a few um, self-care prompts from you, Debbie, from my book, The Just For You Daily Self-Care Journal. Um, and so I thought this was a question or prompt we haven't discussed in a while. It says, what is one of your favorite scents, S-C-E-N-T-S, like sniffing? What do you like to, what smells do you like? Okay. I'm a big aromatherapy person and I use, I use doTERRA, but I, I think any, any aromatherapy is good. Um, I have a bottle of frankincense right here on my hmm. desk. What is and, that for? Um, this is a really, um, it's kind of an abundance. It's kind of an orangey, um, it's got a really unusual smell to it. Um, I, I, I think it's abundance and calmness maybe i'm okay. not even quite sure but um i i like this a lot i like this a, a lot and my do you put it on your wrist or what do you do with it i i put it right on my wrist and i do this when i go to sleep i i go i just go like this i would say if you have sensitive skin you should totally test it yeah. i have never had a reaction but sometimes people do and i'm not a doctor but i put it right on my skin i'm not, i'm kind of a rough and tough girl so i just put it right <laughs> on there and but you can also mix it with coconut oil mm. if you want a little lighter application and uh, I also diffuse it in a little diffuser in my office. So I'm Perfect. almost constantly uh, doing either frankincense or what this orange scent that is all about abundance. Yes. Uh, um, yeah. And I love lavender and Lang Lang. And I mean, I'm, I always put aromatherapy on my wrist before I go to sleep because then I can lay there like this. And just like and, sniff. And just yeah. sniff it or I put it on my <laughs> pajama sleeve. And so I totally use that. I, so I diffuse in my office and I, I use it on my wrist in my bedroom because my significant other doesn't like the diffuser. But, um, you know, I, I oh, oh, the other thing I use scent for is in my body lotion. Hmm. This is a, a, absolutely a good self-care tip, I think. Um, I made a, a, a goal about five years ago to put body lotion on after every shower. And because I noticed that I was just, my skin, not, my skin was getting dry, but. Like crepey looking? Well, yeah, you know, there's yeah. all kinds of things that happen as you get older, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, <laughs> that's one of them. <laughs> so I, but I wanted to, um, I, I, I got to the, I got that routine of putting lotion on after every shower. And that was not an easy thing. You know, that's an extra thing to do. It takes a couple of minutes. It's not, it doesn't sound that big Elizabeth, but when you're running around, like, like I think we do, um, you know, an extra two minutes somehow is, seems like a lot. So I got, first I established that, that habit, that new habit. And this is what I always, um, uh, advise people in the self-care area, start with something small, mm. get it going so that it becomes something that you would never, ever not do just like brushing your teeth and then add something to it. So what I added to the mo moisturizing routine was several drops of aromatherapy. Mm. So now I'm getting, now I'm getting moisturizing and calming, you know, and, and now I will not put the moisturizer on without the drops of essential oil. And that took about six months or so. Elizabeth. A habit. Yeah. Yeah. That's but so now good. it's a good habit. 
Young people on TikTok, I've discovered they have something called an everything shower where like once a week, maybe you do everything, which is kind of like floss your teeth, use those face masks, use your lotions, use your whatever. But maybe we just need to start with a something shower. <laughs> so I'm going to call it like the something shower that Debbie's recommending is like, just do something and then another something. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's so true, Elizabeth. I love the I love the everything shower. Yeah, the something. everything but, shower is the, yeah, leave it to the, the the kids. My kids are and TikTok is making me smarter about some things. Nice. Um, but okay, what's okay, last question, Debbie, is what's something you could do today that your future self would thank you for? Oh boy. Um, there's so many things that come <laughs> into my mind. The self-care thing is big on my mind, Elizabeth, because I I have found the pandemic to be really hard on us all. And uh, I gained some weight and I found myself eating things that I haven't eaten for years, like French fries and banana splits, right? Like I, I'm, you know, <laughs> it, it, and, and uh, so I think, um, there, there's lots of things come into my mind about little things I could do for myself. I'm trying very hard now to get my weight under control and walk more because that, that my future self will thank me for that. And I also do a once a week yoga class. I think all of those things will help me in the future, yeah. but the big thing I do, and this is one of the things I wish I had done when I was caregiving, but I'm doing it now. And I know my future self will thank me is and I don't have the book in front of me. Um, maybe, uh, I'm sorry, I just don't have it in front of me. I do what we call joy journaling. Yes. And, yes. And I, I, you can do it with just a plain white notebook um, and some markers. The, the idea is not to make a big journaling exercise out of this. The idea is to, every morning when you wake up, sit in your chair for about 15 minutes and just doodle or write whatever it is you're feeling or want to happen that day. I write a lot about spaciousness and ease because I'm a little bit of a crazy running around doing things kind of person. And I need more spaciousness and ease in my life. So I might start my journal by saying, you know, I'm so grateful and happy that my life is full of spaciousness and ease, even if I know it's not. Right. <laughs> yes. And then I'll, I'll draw things like I'll draw little hearts or, you know, little feet or, you know, whatever it is that that I don't know, makes me feel good. And my drawings don't have to be perfect. It's just something fun. I bought myself some beautiful uh, Sharpies, all different mm -hmm. colors. And I just um, I noticed that when I first started this process a little over two years ago, I was drawing much more. You know, I would draw the flower out on the deck that I was sitting and looking at. I would, I, I had some free form drawings that my, I look like a stick person, right? I'm not an artist, but, <laughs> but I would have fun with it because the colors were good. And the, uh, the point is to just have some fun mm. and some time to yourself in the morning without the phone without the phone like don't wake up and put your phone on <laughs> like and I think even for a caregiver you know a caregiver might need to look at their text or their messages first thing just to make sure everything's okay yeah. but then give yourself 15 minutes while you drink your coffee or tea to just just have a moment with yourself yeah. and set your intention I give myself one page Sometimes I run over on two, but usually I'm just writing. I usually write a half a page at the first of the day and a half a page at the end. Nice. Because at the end of the day, I I say how thankful I am and grateful I am for the things that are in my life and the people in my life. And, you know, if I did something especially good, I might, you know, put a heart beside it, you know, walk two miles. Or, yes. You know, it's your, it's your, it's like Bob Ross's paintings, right? It's your, it's your journal. You know, you should make it, you can totally do this with your journal. Just write yeah. what you want. Well, write yeah, it. there is plenty of space on these, oh, on these pages that they could definitely, um, I like the word, the, the term joy journaling is, I love that. Yeah. And I love that you but, bookend your day with it. Yeah. And I, but your book is really good because it has prompts that help you get started. 
Yeah. And people, I think that's really important. If they don't important. know where to go, they can do that. But you could also, yeah, make it great. To put your gratitude and everything. I love that. Debbie, thank you for sharing that. This has gone by too fast. I think um, there's been a lot of really good nuggets in here as I knew that there would be when talking to you. So I just wanna thank you for everything that you're doing to try to change and improve the landscape, particularly for working caregivers of older adults. And um, just thank you. I look forward to watching to see what happens next. Well, thank you too, Elizabeth, for all that you do. And I feel a lot of people say things to me like they're they're not exactly in our world, like we're in this world. And and they're like, wow, it's so great what you're doing. And I go, there's an army of us out here. There is an army of us out here. An invisible and, army, but yes. Yes. In and some I'm ways. so, yeah. It's so becoming proud. more visible. Yes. Yeah. I'm very proud to be in that army with you. Thank you. Thank you. See you, Debbie. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us today on the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast on the Whole Care Network. As always, show notes that accompany today's episode can be found on my website, happyhealthycaregiver.com. Just look under the podcast menu for today's episode image, and that will take you to the page with the links and information we spoke about today. You'll also find other resources on the website along with links to purchase the Just For You Daily Self-Care Journal. When you purchase from my website, you'll get a signed copy and for a limited time, free shipping. If you've enjoyed what you heard today, consider subscribing to the show on your podcast platform. It really helps other family caregivers find the podcast and you'll automatically receive our bi-weekly shows in your podcast listening queue. Maybe while you're subscribing, consider leaving a five-star rating and review or just simply talk it up on your social channels. Let's stay connected. I'm on Instagram and Facebook as Happy Healthy Caregiver. And until we meet again, please take care of you. This is WCN. The Whole Care Network. You talk. We listen.